anyone who has a working internet connection will likely be aware that there is some drama going on in the Games Workshop hobby community at the moment about whether or not girls are allowed to wear big suits of golden armour. Uh, one of the reasons that has been given as to why this is unacceptable behaviour is that it's a change to the law. And how dare Games Workshop change the law? They've never done anything like this before in the past, and it's simply not cricket. Well, as you may have guessed from the title of this video, I'm going to suggest that this is not a new thing. And instead, I'm going to give you my version of the top 10 times that Games Workshop dramatically changed the law and just pretended like it had been that way all the time. I am going to grade these from the most, <laughs> from the least serious through to what seems to have provoked the most reaction using a highly technical device known as the Freakoutometer, which you'll see in the bottom corner of the screen there. So, without further ado, let's dive right in. Um, straight in here then at number 10 is the Necrons. Now, Necrons came into 40k in second edition when they were kind of introduced through the pages of White Dwarf as being this previously hitherto unencountered race of strange robotic raiders and then landed with a vengeance in third edition. During third edition, they got released with their own codex and an entirely new insert into the law. It turns out that these are not a new race of strange robots that have never been encountered before. No, in fact, they have been in the galaxy basically as long as there has been a galaxy. Not only that, but they are quite possibly the oldest surviving race, if we can give it that term, given that they are weird robots, that have been within the galactic plane of all the races that are out there. It would seem that they waged a millennia-long war against the Old Ones and their descendants, the Eldar. And the Eldar just forgot to mention it in any of the previous publications that Games Workshop had prior to 3rd edition. Not only that, but core aspects of the Necron lore, such as the Nightbringer, suggest that this is in fact the origin of the image of death seen by all other species in the galaxy. But again, we just all forgot this, apparently. This was slipped into the law by Games Workshop, like I say, midway through third edition, with a resounding response of, yeah, okay, that's cool. As we can see from the Freakoutometer, there was an absolute zero reaction. The Necrons were, were now this race of long-dead beings that were here in robotic bodies, ruled over by dark star gods, and the rest of the 40k universe were going to have to deal with the fact that they were back and they wanted their stuff back. And we all just kind of went, cool, okay, I, I can dry brush them. That's an army I can dry brush. And they've got cool green plastic rods in their guns. Yes, please. Zero on the Freakoutometer. Let's move on. Item number nine, then. Another race that made an appearance during 3rd edition 40k that had never previously been mentioned at any point in the lore was the Tau. Uh, one of my friends over on the Morehammer Discord recently commented about how his reaction to rocking up to his Games Workshop store with his then toughest tank in the game, the venerable Land Raider, with an armor value of 14 on all sides, and a machine spirit that let it keep functioning even after it had been shot, suddenly being introduced into the setting's first ever Strength 10 gun was perhaps a little surprising. But not as surprising as there just being an entire new alien race that nobody had ever bothered to mention before. This wasn't so much a, a new race that had been newly discovered. No, it turns out the Adeptus Mechanicus had discovered this race back during the Great Crusade and had then kind of earmarked them for exterminatus at a later date, presumably because they'd run out of exterminatus bombs at that time or perhaps were late for their dinner and had to scoot off back to Mars. In any event, what they found was a Stone Age civilization uh, and I, maybe I don't know, maybe they thought it would be funny to come back at just around the time they'd started to invent primitive propeller aircraft and then make it, you know, more sporting afternoon of Exterminatus rather than just doing their damn job and killing the Xenos there and then. No, it, the Tau, therefore, when the Imperium encountered them again, were perhaps more high-tech than the Imperium. I think that might be heresy to say that. But again... The response from fans was a resounding, oh yeah, cool. So you mean I get to play like anime guys, like Gundam suits? Oh, cool. Okay. Oh, and I get to move. These guys are cool to the rules. I get to move twice in my turn, both in the movement phase and in the assault phase. Brilliant. 
The overarching response to them being inserted into the law was again on the free countometer and residing. Okay, great. Let's keep going. More games for us to play. Brilliant. Let's move on. Number eight. Not so much a new race, but a returning race. So the Votan, or let's call them what they are, the Squats, that had been around throughout Road Trader, had rules in second edition, and then were just quietly swept under the rug when third edition was released. And many years later, within the lore, it was established that in actual fact, all of the Squats had been devoured by the Hive Fleets, presumably just to stop people from constantly bugging Games Workshop and asking, when are Squats coming back? In any event... Back during 9th edition, suddenly it turns out that the Squats aren't all dead. In fact, there are loads of them, and they've been scattered across the galaxy, happily mining things and hanging out on Necromunda, and you know, all that stuff about the High Fleet having eaten them, that was just a big misunderstanding. The reaction from the, from the Games Workshop community? Awesome! Great! Space Dwarves! Oh, cool! They've got actual kind of characteristic rules that represent grudges and stuff. Brilliant! Ah, oh, those holobites are great! Total reaction? No, absolute zero. Again, they're on the freakout scale. Uh, let's move on. Number seven on the list of retcons by Games Workshop. The Unremembered Empire. Now, I know this may not technically be a 40k entry, but it, it leads into 40k, given that Bobby G is running around now in the 41st millennium. So I'm going to count it. When Games Workshop wrote the law for the Horus Heresy, way back again in the kind of the Rogue Trader and Second Edition 40k times, um, Gulliman was mentioned as being uh, heavily involved in all kinds of aspects, but at the point that the War on Terror broke out, it was simply mentioned he was stuck out on the Eastern Fringe and was too far to make it to Terror in time to play a vital role. What we found out through the Horus Heresy novels is that in point of fact, actually, Gulliman wasn't so much too busy to make it to uh, the War on Terror. In actual fact, it was that he had decided to kind of launch his own break-off solo career and start his own Imperium, damn it! And, yeah, again, this was an entirely new aspect of Horus Heresy. I know a lot of the Horus Heresy, we got kind of enhancements of stuff that had already been referred to before, but inserting the idea that Gulliman just started Imperium 2.0 and then released it presumably with a new pine fresh scent and, you know, maybe a new browser interface... Complete zero reaction. I think actually the reaction from the community was meh. It wasn't even that interesting an aspect. We all just kind of wanted to get back to what was happening on Terra. But anyway, let, let, let's move on from that. My point being, this huge change in many respects to the established law of the way in which space marines work had zero impact. I don't think people even talked about it, to be honest. It was like, oh cool, Dan Abbott's got a new book out. I think the thing that got more of a conversation from that book was the fact that Gulliman had a mother compared to some of the other Primarchs. I mean, that was like, oh, wow, he actually got to know his mum. Brilliant. Let's move on. Number six on my list, Vashtor the Archifane, uh, a guy who was just randomly introduced in the closing at eight hours of ninth edition with his own army list and a whole year-long narrative story arc through the arcs of omen which i've got to be honest maybe it's because i don't play 40k as much as i should but i didn't follow it that much aside from reading it in white dwarf and kind of picking up from the warhammer community articles what was happening i certainly don't remember anybody going oh my god they've introduced this entirely new character who is virtually a new member of the chaos pantheon like he is such an important and vital character that he has been for millennia collecting the broken pieces of the rock the dark angels homeworld of caliban to create some kind of new and terrible force that's going to tie together all the fairly weak storylines that featured the dark angels in the horror heresy novels oh my god no every one kind of went oh that's what that model from the community uh sneaky peaks was from okay right next yeah on the freak out scale we see still the needle is not even moving i think to be honest most people have even forgotten that vashtor even exists now in 10th edition i don't really see maybe when the chaos uh, codex gets re-released he'll get more of a boost in his law i don't personally see him playing much of a role in the ongoing narrative from this point onwards. Uh, he is a non-entity who apparently previously has been a huge manipulator behind the scenes. And we all just kind of shrugged our shoulders and moved on. Speaking of which, let's move on now into the top five. Number five on my list. It's the Necrons, again. 
So, not content with having made the Necrons this massively threatening entity that had always existed in the 40k universe, uh, but that we just never heard of before, Games Workshop, way back in 6th edition, decided to do it again, and they completely rejigged the Necrons. I mean, in terms of they'd gone, okay, this is the law for Necrons in 2nd edition. No, actually, this is the law for Necrons in 3rd edition. Oh, here we are in 6th edition, let's have what the law is for Necrons again. It turns out that actually they are not slaves to the Catan. No, no, the Catan, in fact, are slaves to them. And they are, in fact, still sentient, at least among the royal households, and have up, did up to all kinds of shenanigans, the length and breadth of the galaxy. And as we move forward into 8th and 9th edition, it turns out that actually they've got this vast army that's been loitering just outside the galactic plane that is going to come back and reclaim the galaxy and kill the Tyranids and who knows what else. Not content with what they had done with the law for Necrons before, Games Workshop decided again to kind of flip it over, respray it, give it a new paint job. We've all done that with miniatures, I suppose, so I don't blame them for doing it with their law, but it was an absolute inversion of what the Necrons law had been before. This one actually does move the needle slightly on the free countometer. I've registered just a slight quiver down the bottom there where some people went, hang on a minute. I thought the Necrons were the ones that were, like, enslaved to the Catan. N not the other way around. Oh, okay, well, fine. I mean, those cool models look nice. I'll happily paint them. Yeah, okay, give me the codex. Let's go. Let's move on. Okay, number four. Abaddon the Despoiler's Black Crusade. The 13th Black Crusade, as featured in the Eye of Terror campaign. This was a, as I've mentioned in a previous video, a global campaign that would determine the fate of the galaxy, and in particular, the fate of Cadia. And having had the results sent in from across the world, Games Workshop decided to just ignore them and pretend the entire event had never happened. So that years later, when the Fall of Cadia supplement was released. We can pretend that everything that featured in this codex, the return of the 13th Company, the death of Eldrad Ulthuan, and we'll get to that in a minute, none of it had actually happened. The, I think there was a slight reaction to this. It was a delayed reaction because the internet was not as prevalent back at this time as it is now. Certainly I remember a war seer, there were a few people going, well hang on, why did we fight a, a giant global campaign then if you're just going to ignore the results and pretend that none of it actually affected the law whatsoever? I'm over, off over here to play War Machine where at least they do change the law every once in a while. Uh, a slight quiver on the needle there, again, slightly more than we got with the Necrons, and let's move on to <laughs> quite possibly one of the craziest changes that they're in. So the one thing that Games Workshop did do from the Eye of Terror campaign was they killed Eldrad Ulthuan. They decided actually that the forces of Ulthuay had been slain, and uh, although Morgan Ra had escaped uh, and, and uh, managed to help one of the lost craft worlds, the craft world of Altansar, to escape from the Eye of Terror, um, Eldrad Ulthuan had met his end and died at the hands of Chaos. And that became the law for about five years. And then, as we clock in here now at number three, Games Workshop decided that they wanted to release a new Eldrad Ulthuan model. So it turns out that actually he had foreseen his death, manipulated the strands of fate so that he could effectively retcon his own death. This is going to be one of the classiest examples of retconning I've ever seen Games Workshop indulge in. They not only retconned killing off one of their core characters, but they actually brought Eldrad back from the dead at his own hand. A classic example of just as planned. Um, this did have some small stirrings at the time, with a lot of people on, like, in particular, like Facebook and so forth, going, hang on a minute, but Eldrad was dead. What? Why is there a new Eldrad model? Okay, well, it's a cool Eldrad model. Oh, and it comes in a box with Death Watch. Captain Artemis. Okay, and then off we went again. Just a small movement of the needle down there. Uh, let's move on now to the top two examples of Games Workshop retconning. Number two. Okay, I could do an entire section just about all the different unit types that Games Workshop have chosen to release over the years and then pretend were there all the time. What do you mean that the Space Marines have always had thud guns? I don't care that they were used once a squat weapon. No, no, Space Marines have always had these. Yes, no, there have always been lots of variants of the Lehman Russ. It's just, no, I know we only said there were like three variants of the Lehman Russ, but it turns out there were loads and lots of Forge Wars produce them. By far the best example, though, of a unit that is just shoehorned into the law and never having been there before has to be the Space Wolf Wolfy Wolf 
Thunderwolf Cavalry. You like, we heard you like wolves, bro. Then you will love wolves riding on wolves, Viking werewolf wolves on wolves, which have never at any point been mentioned in any of preceding lore. They weren't mentioned in any of the preceding codices. They weren't mentioned in the fairly classy Black Library novel series by William King that I often refer to as Ragnar Goes to Hogwarts. But suddenly, there we are in 5th edition 40k, the Space Wolves Codex lands, and here they are, wolves riding on giant wolves, but there are no wolves on Fenris. Uh, this has to be, this did, and still, to a degree, causes a stir, especially the fact that the Horus Heresy players just ignore the fact that they exist and go, no, no, there are no, no wolves on Fenris, there are no giant wolves, that's why Lehman Ross's armies in the Great Crusade were not riding around on giant wolves, presumably they got introduced after, he, maybe that's why he left. Maybe he's like, you've, you've, you've brought in, you've started riding the giant wolves. No, that's too much for me, bro. I'm out. Uh, I, I, there is some small movement of the needle there insofar as people still, I'm joking about it now. People still joke about it today. Let's move on then to the number one biggest example of Games Workshop law revision to date prior to the introduction of girls. And, and that is the Primarist Space Marines. Okay, so... Uh, yeah, the needle has jumped there. You can see that instantly. That's almost halfway up. At the time when these were introduced, the fact that we were suddenly being told that there was this whole new type of space marines that had always been there, that it turns out that Mars is hollow and just filled with room upon room of shelves of space marines that Belisarius Core has been holding there since the closing days of the heresy because at humanity's darkest point, Rupert Gulliman didn't feel that that was the time to say to um, Belisarius Core, yeah, Go ahead, release the untold extra legions that the Emperor absolutely could have used. No, 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 no. They have always been sat there on Mars for the last 10,000 years, but now here they are. And I've got to be honest, I think the thing that people reacted most to was the fear of the fact that their traditional tactical marines might be going away. That's the craziest thing about this. It wasn't at that point the change in law that has caused the needle to move, but rather the possibility that their existing toys might no longer be playable and that they might have to buy new toys. That then is the biggest change that I have documented <laughs> that has occurred in the 40k lore in, gotta be the last 30 years. And I think the biggest reaction that people have had from it was whether or not it was going to change the way in which they use their toys. Whether or not custodes underneath all that heavy gold armor are boys, or girls, is going to affect how you use your models this much. And I know that therefore perhaps leads to the argument of, oh, well then why do they need to be changed in the first place? Well, why not? It's interesting. It's cool. It turns out that where we thought they were just a whole bunch of guys running around in gold armor, no, in fact, it's a more varied and interesting setting. It's a setting which allows different perspectives. It's a setting in which perhaps more people might feel represented, albeit represented as genetically modified child soldiers engaged in an aeons long conflict that they can never win in a post-apocalyptic hellscape. To everybody though who is saying that this is the worst thing ever and the Games Workshop is destroying the hobby, I, I, I say purely on my own behalf, get a grip. Games Workshop will always do what they want to with their own lore. And at the moment, it seems what they want to do is make it more inclusive by varying what stories can be told, by allowing for more, more character to be added to armies. And I think that's cool. If you don't think that's cool, but you are determined that you want to play Adeptus Custodes, then fine. Play your Adeptus Custodes how you want to, but please do not tell other people that they are wrong if they now decide to put a girl's head on one of their Custodes models. Because they're not! It turns out that that Brother Shield Captain was there the whole time. And I think, personally, that's quite cool. Um, on that bombshell, I'm going to leave you there. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with me on this. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, I will be back next week with more Old World content, so if that floats your boat, then come back for that. Uh, and in the meantime, as ever, you can catch me every week on the More Hammer podcasts. If you're not a subscriber there, please do subscribe. If you're not a subscriber here, 
please do take the time to click subscribe. I'm on my way to trying to get to 4,000 subscribers. Once I do, I am giving away an Imperial Space Marine, a classic metal Imperial Space Marine model, to one lucky participant. Uh, to find out how to win that, go back and watch my Man vs. Skaven video. Uh, all it leaves me then to say now, then, is thank you very much for watching. And as ever, I will catch you next time. Bye for now.